it's, it's I'm really honored that I was invited. Um, this is, I, I haven't given a talk, an astronomy talk in a long time. So this is a, a pretty cool. And it's really neat to see some old faces. Um, I th you know, like we were talking earlier, I, I, you know, to be, I, I, wow, I, you know, that in 1980, in 1994, uh, in Washington at the Naval Observatory, that was actually an amazing night. Um, uh, I am, uh, my name is, is, is Bob Bungie. Uh, it's pronounced a little strange, like there's two E's on the end, but uh, you can call me Hey You, I'll usually answer to it. Um, I I have been an astronomer, I, mean, I, became, I, I got an interest in an amateur astronomer when I was a senior in high school in, 19, in 1979, graduated in 1980, and I've been an active amateur the entire time. I, I think that's, in the world of amateurs, I think that's fairly uncommon that people stay caught, stay, stay active that long. Um, but it's been it's been an amazing ride, and it's I, I think back at times of how things have changed uh, from from using just minimal star atlases to uh, and, and and digging for information in libraries and reading books in libraries to just what we've seen this last week. It's just the the, the change in the technology, the change in, in 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 the information available is just mind boggling to me. Um, but I'm also tend to be old school, so. We can talk about that a little later, but um, uh, over the years, um, I've, I, I'm a telescope builder. Um, in fact, I've built basically all the telescopes I've used uh, for the most part. Uh, I, I uh, make my, I've made, I made mirrors years ago. I taught a telescope making class for several years. I taught, I was co-teacher of a, of a mirror making class in Columbus, Ohio for a number of years. Um, those are all good years and good times. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I've e even though I was trained as a photographer in the Navy, in the U.S. Navy, um, I've generally been a, f a, a visual observer most of my most of my life. I've dabbled in imagery every now and then, but mostly a visual observer. Um, <clears throat> and I early on developed a, a love for deep sky, um, and I early on I developed a, a love for for uh, faint galaxies and for globular clusters for whatever reason. And I would generally try to observe as many galaxies as I could. And a few of you may know Brent Arkinall, might may have heard of Brent, Arca, Brent Arkinall. We knew each other in Columbus, Ohio. And then um, he, he moved to uh, Washington, DC uh, in, in, the 19, in the late 1980s when I was at Ohio State University. I met my wife who was actually in a, a PhD astronomy candidate at the, at the astronomy department there. And she got a job in Maryland at Goddard Space Flight Center. So I sort of followed her out here. So I'm in Maryland these days. And Brent and I were observing partners for ages and ages and ages. And uh, I always showed up with, the, with the, 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 the big telescope and he would show up with a list of really interesting things to look at. And that went on for a long time. And I just didn't worry, you know, I, whatever Brent wanted to look at was good for me because it was usually really good, really interesting to look at. Um, and then he got a job out in Flagstaff, Arizona, moved out west, and I suddenly found myself having to go, wow, what am I going to look at now? And uh, one of the things that struck me in looking around is uh, the Astronomical League had a list of, had, had one of the observing projects for the ARC galaxies. Um, at the time, way back when, it was primarily, um, at, at the time, it was primarily, it seemed to be primarily focused at at, uh, at, at C, for CCD imaging, but there was a, you, you could also, you, there was also a visual observer track. Um, I took a look at it and said, faint galaxies, little groups of faint galaxies, this would be great. So I, I started down that list. And in case you're not aware of it, um, uh, the ARC galaxy, the ARC, the ARC catalog of particular galaxies uh, is, is a catalog of 338 particularly looking galaxies compiled by astronomer. Alan Harp in the, in the 1960s. He did it in a better, he, he, he developed the catalog to get a better understanding of how to build a taxonomy of galaxy types. Um, he, his, uh, and it actually is an inter, it's, it's obviously an interesting group. It's a, a, an interesting uh, a collection of, of galaxy clusters, galaxy groups. Um, they're, you know, today we realize that they're interacting and they're tidally influenced with each other. You know, he he had some other ideas about it, and you know, okay, that's the way. That's 
cold because it's the way science works, right? Um, these are some some of the gal some of the pictures of the of the galaxies that from his catalog. So when he developed the catalog in the '60s, obviously it was still there was it was still photography and. Um, the, a lot of these objects are pretty faint, and he saw a lot of connections between these galaxies. Uh, uh, you know, as we as we as we're all pretty familiar with today, and in fact, uh, uh, which one is it? ARP ARP three nineteen is Stefan's quintet. So we've gone from relatively fuzzy galaxy images, even back in the '60s, to what we see today with the web uh, in infrared, which is pretty astonishing. Um, but it's also interesting that it's because these galaxies, you know, he, he was interested why these galaxies look so odd or how different or why they were so particular. Um, but that also plays a role into why amateurs are interested in them today, like I was, because it was not only, you know, in, in the telescopes I had access to and the skies I had access to, what could I see? Could I see not only all of the members of a group or could I even, at what point with what, which ones could I even start to see any connect, connectivity between them? Could I, how much detail could I see? <clears throat> and again, it, 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 it uh, appealed to me uh, because it was a plug and play list. I, I, it was an observing program. It was gonna be fun. It was gonna be interesting. And most of all, for me, it was gonna be challenging. And I didn't have to do a whole lot of research uh, to, to come up with the list. Um, I've done that in the past, and it can be a lot of fun to come up with different observing lists, but in this case, it was just easy to plug along. I did not realize what I was getting into, and I did not realize how long it was going to take. So I set a goal early on. I wanted to observe all 338 objects. And most importantly, I wanted to record not only a visual description, but I wanted to make a pencil drawing of each one. So where I, I, a lot of visual astronomers, you know, will, will maybe write, you know, if they do take notes, they write a few notes or something. But I wanted to try to take it the next step and see what happened if I, if I at the eyepiece, if I try to take a, a rough sketch. And typically what I get when I would get home uh, the next day or two, I would, I would try to clean, clean the sketches up a little bit, maybe add, it, add a little bit of shading. Um, and I, the, I, I had intuitively, I guess, sensed that if I, if I made a drawing of each object, it would force me to spend time at the eyepiece and actually look really, really carefully. And, and many years later now, I, when I interact with new, new, new amateurs who are just getting into deep sky observing, especially, and even more importantly, uh, in some respects, planetary observing, I, I just, I, I stress over and over and over, if you're, especially with a planet, but if you're spending less than 30 or 40 seconds with your eyeball glued to the eyepiece, you're not seeing it. You're not spending enough time. You, sh you need to spend more time, you know, the more time you look, the more time you study. And in my case, and I found this to be true, when I tried to, when I draw, I think I'm seeing more because I'm forcing, my, I'm forcing myself to look for more. Um, the tools I had, uh, I used, and, and I cheated in, in a way, in a couple of ways, but um, I mostly used six inch, uh, six inch, 12 inch, and a tw 20 inch telescopes. I did make, I do have a couple observations I made with a 31 inch telescope I used back in Ohio. Um, most of the observations were made with the 20 inch telescope. Um, I started off with a list, literally the hand printed list, the, the, the you know, the, 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 the list printed out from a computer from the astronomical list from the astronomical league and i would somewhat painfully in the field go through and figure out what was up and or even the night you know before i went out to try to figure out what was up and figure out where what charts they were in the, the old-fashioned way i guess you could say when you figure out what charts they were and what in, in uranometria if you remember that atlas and then star hop my way to them and make the drawing and mark them mark them off on the list um, at some point, the primary telescope I used, I was able to interface with a computer program called Megastar, which used to be sold by Roman Bell and is now uh, free. I actually host that software, if the, the repository of that software. If you're interested, let me know. Um, 
and I got the, tele, I got the telescope interfaced with a laptop and uh, 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 digital, digital setting circles called Sky Commander, my notebook, and a whole lot of Red Bull. Um, I started off observing uh, the list at CM Crockett Park, which is in Northern Virginia, just south of Manassas, Virginia, south of Washington, DC, on June 11th, 1999. And check this out, it took me a decade. I made the last observation in November, no, November 21st, 2009. I observed uh, these objects from 14 different observing sites um, in seven US states. And they, the observing sites ranged from about 20 feet out of two, which is one of my primary observing sites on the eastern shore of Maryland. So that's, on, that's, between, that's the spit of land between the Chesapeake Bay and, and, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's literally about 20 feet above uh, above the surface of the ocean. And uh, I made a, a few observations from 6,000 feet at Table Mountain Star Party in, uh, in, in Washington State. Um, here I list I list the 31 inch well. The 20 inch F6 Dobsonian that I, I call TJ was the workhorse. It, it was used for 298 of the observations. And in the course of, uh, uh, of building that, rebuilding and rebuilding that telescope by 1999 or so, I turned it in, uh, uh, interfaced with Megastar, I turned it into a pretty mean observing machine, as I like to call, call it. And it changed the way I worked specifically because I was able to import a list of all of the arc galaxies into Megastar. And it's just a text file on the computer. And I could go to an area of sky and Megastar would show me where you know what 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 galaxies uh, what are what arp objects were up, I could point to and I could uh, push to the telescope to the object, make the observation, move on to the next one, push to move on to the next one and keep going, and then the next day when I was back home, I could fire up the laptop and just basically go through and delete in the text files the the objects I had observed the night before, and that meant that the next time I went out, I just Okay, what's up where and where do I find it and point the telescope and and uh, see what I can see. Um, this is a, I'll just go through a few examples of what I what I what I captured. So this is the 31 inch F7 telescope as it was back in those days in Mansfield, Ohio at Warren Rupp Observatory. Uh, this is M77. Um, I uh, built a 12 inch telescope that was airline transportable. Um, I took this to, uh, I took this telescope a couple of times to my in-laws were in Pasco, Washington state. Uh, so Pasco, Washington is on the desert side of Washington state. So I was observing from the desert. It's on the east side of the, uh, of the mountains. It is very much desert and, and my in-laws had a farm and it was actually, if I could talk them into turning out all the lights, so it was actually quite dark there. And I, and I purposely tended not to look at bright objects with the 20 inch, reserving them instead for, for when I was going to have an opportunity with one of the smaller telescopes, and some more call it exotic or different locations. And this was an example of it. And I was able to set the 12 inch telescope up in their driveway and make this observation of M51, which is our, ARP 85, and this had the additional bonus of, uh, of, of I made the observation when Supernova 2005 CS was, was visible. Um, here's, the, here's a little six inch telescope that I used to observe M31 uh, from Table Mountain, Washington State, while I was out there visiting one time. This telescope is sort of special to my heart from the standpoint that uh, I ground the mirror and made the telescope while I was on, while I was in the Navy and on a US aircraft carrier and uh, used it to do a fair amount of variable star observing from the ship. And uh, it went to Australia. It went, uh, it, well, it made three, it made a total of three cruises with me to the Indian Ocean and back, six trips through the Suez Canal. And since then it has been on a couple of, it's been just two, two solar eclipses. And uh, a couple of, uh, and a couple, and a, a number of other trips is a particularly fun telescope to take because I can pack it in a very small bag. And it was a fun telescope to use for this observation. Um, 
here's a, an observation of ARP 244, uh, the Ringtail Galaxy, and uh, from Winter Star Party in Florida, in the Florida Keys, in 2001. Um, Laurel Highland Star Cruise. What an interesting name for a star party. No longer is no longer in place, but it uh, it was uh, sponsored by the uh, Astronomy Club out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and hosted at a really nice site in uh, Western Maryland, practically a mile from the Pennsylvania border. Um, it's sort of sad that the star party is no longer in place because it was a, it was no longer happening because it was a good location relatively dark skies, but this is from West Virginia. Um, and in my primary observing site, Tuckahoe State Park, like I mentioned in uh, Maryland on the Eastern shore, sort of across the Chesapeake Bay from Annapolis, Maryland. And this is ARP 100. Um, I'm gonna read between the lines here where I cut this off that it was 24 degrees when I made this observation. Yikes. Um, this this is a drawing of uh, ARP 113. I made this I made this drawing from Big Meadows Park, which is in the Appalachians along Skyline Drive, um, in Virginia. And you can see uh, there's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven galaxies. And at some point, I went through and I numbered. Those are probably the last two digits of NGC numbers for each of the objects. And um, uh, we had a local star party called the Delmarva Star Party, which was at the Tuckahoe site. And made this drawing of ARP 333 um, in, in 2004. Um, it certainly was a fun and very challenging project. Um, like, I com like I commented, I, I not only really improved my drawing skills and got very good at it, um, just by doing so many of them. But it, it, I think it improved my, my seeing, my skills to see detail through ver using averted vision and faint objects. Um, and also even just detecting because some of them were very faint and uh, you know, why the skies, well, they were a lot better than there. They've gone downhill fair amount, but at, even at Tuckahoe, some of the objects are even at a 20 inch and in, I guess what you would call, uh, I wanna say Bortle three skies today. Uh, they, they, some of them were pretty hard to see. Just, just, just to see them was a challenge. Um, if you're at all interested or going in this direction, uh, it's, it's a fun thing to observe, and it's something you can do reasonably casually. Uh, like, you know, it took me a decade. You know, I, so it, 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 you know, it's not a project that goes very quickly unless you can observe like every night, I guess, or. You know, if, you, if you're if you're in dark skies and can walk outside or something like that. But in my case, I'm typically, uh, you know, I was typically loading up the telescope, the 20-inch telescope in a vehicle and driving an hour, uh, anywhere from one and a half to three hours to get to the observing site and back. Uh, well, Tucka was only maybe an hour and 20 minutes away. So it was always a task. Um, and to make it even worse in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm, I'm dealing with traffic getting to any, where I live. I have to deal with traffic to get to any deep sky site. Um, so in, in, in the case of going out on a Friday night to, to the Eastern shore, I am riding along with everyone else going to the beach. So while everyone's you know in their beach gear and stuff heading to the, trying to go over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. In these days, I had a relatively, well, I had a 1998 Ford Escort and the telescope was jammed in the back and this huge 10 foot ladder and struts for the telescope were strapped to the roof. And these people would just stare at me. What is he doing? Um, soon after I finished this project, I gave a very similar talk to this to the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. And um, literally a couple of weeks before I gave that talk, I got a mailer from Roman Bell about this book. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's the ring tail, right? Um, you know, here I am. You know, I, I've just spent the last 10 years working on this. And, and it turns out that Jeff, who I worked with a little bit way back in the 80s when I wrote some articles for, for uh, Astronomy Magazine, and Dennis had, had worked on this book. And, and much to my amazement, Jeff showed up at the, start, at, at the meeting that I gave a talk to about it. Um, so 
and, and we both looked at each other and he was like, he was like, I wish I knew you were doing this. You have all these drawings, like, you know, they could have used them in the book. But uh, unfortunately, the book's no longer available. I, I know, um, uh, I think it was the Astronomical Society of the Pacific or somebody took over the Wellman Bell books. And when I went and looked for them, I, I, I was unable to find this particular book. Unfortunately, I never got a copy. And if you go on in the used book, used book market today, they're pretty expensive, as they oftentimes are. But when I when I looked through it a couple of times and spent I spent I got to spend a little bit of time sitting or sitting with one of them. This was an excellent book. So if you have one or you can get a hold of one, um, they've got finder charts and observing notes. It's it's a good it's a good resource if you can get your hands on it. Um, what was next for me as I wound down with the ARP galaxies and I had long periods. I had seasonal periods in the sky where I had observed all the ARP galaxies. Um, I said, I need to do something next. Well, I'd never actually done it. So I said, let me go after the Herschel 400 list. And that's what I, and that, so that's what I started. So when there wasn't an ARP galaxy available, I'd go after a Herschel 400 object. And I decided I would do the same thing. I would sketch them all. And I actually finished that uh, last month, uh, observing from Spruce, uh, Spruce Knob, uh, a, a 3,400 foot mountain in uh, West Virginia. I finished my last three Herschel 400 objects. And I'm actually about halfway through the Herschel 2 list as well. So when I finish that, I'll probably have all together, probably I wanna say about 1500 drawings, maybe, maybe closer to 1800 drawings. And it will be interesting to see what my kids do with them. Um, anyway, here's some contact information if you wanna contact me um, or uh, um, et cetera. And I'm all open for questions, comments. Let me unmute myself here. Uh, what, what, which one, did you find yourself using the 12 inch much? No, I, I, I really, I, I tended to only use it for the Arb galaxies when I was traveling. So when I took it to some place like Table Mountain or I took it to, uh, I, I took it to Oregon Star Party. Um, uh, but around um, around here, if I was observing from my home base, it was the 20 inch just because it, it was the better instrument. It was, uh, you know, better aperture. It was, it had pretty good optics at the time. It has much better optics today. I refigured it a few years ago. Um, uh, um, and uh, I, it, it was just a very, it's a very comfortable machine, comfortable to, uh, I I instrument for me to use. Yeah, I was just asking because uh, 12 inches manageable for me, I can't do ladders in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the la you know, I'm, 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 I'm just, you know, I'm 60 now and I'm beginning to wonder how long I'm, uh, it's got a, it's an F, it's an F6, so it's very long. Um, I had it at Starfest Star Party up in Canada many years ago. It's in a different form today, but I had it, you know, a, it's a 10 foot ladder. Um, I really enjoy the telescope, but uh, it, it's, it's the ladder is going to be a challenge at some point. Bob, I wanted to say that I, it's been a long time since, since you and I have been in touch. And uh, I really did enjoy this uh, visit into ARPS galaxies. It reminded me of how Clyde, how upset Clyde Tombaugh was at uh, Arp's treatment at Mel Wilson and Palomar, how he was denied time because they didn't like his theories about the unusual galaxies. And I'm so glad to hear that he is now undergoing a renaissance of, uh, of respect. Uh, Tim Hunter here in Tucson is working on a project to photograph all of the art galaxies. And you may be interested in sharing your drawings with him. Just wanted to say that and congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, yeah, it's fantastic to see you. It's been a long time. <laughs> so I, I had a question. Um, a couple of us were actually down at uh, I guess Hidden Hollow in 1992 or so, we got to look through the 31 inch. And I actually met Brent Arkinall there. That was 
That was a quite an incredible telescope to look through. I was going to say, I think you were very lucky to have him show up with a big list of objects and 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 look at them through that telescope. I mean, what a great what a great observing site and great observatory, especially back then. Yeah, that's when Brent and I started to uh, to observe together, and he would come up with uh, he would come up with the list and 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 you know my my one of my favorite stories, if you don't mind me going off uh, in, in a tangent, is. He showed up, and it was actually an article out of Tele Sky and Telescope magazine about with uh, uh, information about a planetary nebula in M15. And P's one. back then, it was known as P's one. I, yeah. I still know. I guess it's got other. It's got 18 other different designations, but um, we, we, you know, the, 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 it was clear. The scene was good. We we were able to get it get that you know get a good view right on the meridian. We were able to get that thing up to, to like 800 power, and we just looked and looked and looked, and we must have looked at it for an hour, and we came back, we, we took a break, and we came back, and we looked some more, and we were just on the verge of just giving up, and it suddenly occurred to us that Sky and Telescope had printed the picture backwards, and as soon as we flipped it over and put a flashlight behind the picture, it took us about 30 seconds to find it. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> but um, that, that was a fun, that was, a, I was blessed in the 80s, late 80s to have access, literally access to a telescope anytime I wanted to. Um, if you're not aware, you know, the mirror was tragically broken. And uh, insurance paid for a new one. And it is now like an F, I want to say it's a 36 inch F5, something to that effect. I've been there a couple of times, but have not managed to look through the new incarnation of that telescope. But, but then after Brent had graduated from Ohio State in Columbus, he had moved here to Washington, D.C. to work at the Naval Observatory. So when, when I came out here with my wife, we, we were back together again, and he had been observing with a 6-inch, and I'm showing up with a 20-inch, and, and uh, you know we're, we're, we were right back at it until he moved out to Flagstaff. I was going to ask a follow-up question. How long uh, do you spend doing one of those sketches? Like you did all of the ARP galaxies, and how, how long would you say per sketch, like per observation? So um, that, that's a that's a really good question. I I have honed it down. You know, early on, I spent a lot more time, and I would tend to want to do shading. In other words, I I would sort of outline where the nebula you know, where, where, the, where the, the difference in contrast, contrast between the, the sky background and the object was. And then I would try to, you know, put the pencil on its side and, you know, sort of like, well, yeah, I guess you guys aren't, maybe I'll stop sharing here for a second. And, you know, and I, I, and I would use the edge of the pencil and, and try to shade something like this. And I found over, and it would take not only take a long time at the eyepiece, but I found it was not a, a, a really good way to do just using a red flashlight. So I, I developed sort of what I, a self-honed method of, I, I used it, the tip of the pencil to lightly on the, I, I, I dot out the stars, the star locations on the paper and then on, on my observing form. And then I very lightly, we using the tip of the pencil sort of highlight the, the shape of the object. And then I might make smaller um, uh, markings as to where, as to the brightness and the details that I could see. Any foreground stars, any, in, in some galaxies, of course, you know, the, the clusters that you, the, the, the bright areas that you might see in the galaxy. And then typically, ideally the next day, while it's still fresh in my memory, I will pull them out in, under normal conditions in the ho at home. I will um, artist them out, so to speak, and try to make them look prettier. And how do you um, do that? What tools do you use? I It's a number two pencil on copy paper. And, and oh, oh, and and I will generally, um, and an eraser, the eraser on the tip of the pencil. So I, I oftentimes will get a new pencil every time I do this. Um, just so I have a nice fresh eraser because I will tend to, uh, 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 I will tend to shadow out larger than the galaxy is, and then larger than what I've drawn, and then I will use uh, the eraser to shape it, and then I will use my fingertips to spread out the and, and smear out the pencil uh, 
the 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 pencil a little bit to get the to get the effect and the shading that that that, I, that I'm looking for. That's good. That yeah, helps. yeah. No, that does help because drawing and sketching is so difficult, and some people use a lot of different tools, and some people keep it really simple. And you know, yeah, it's, I, it's I tend, good to I, hear how you do that sort of thing. I I, I tend to keep it simple, and 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 uh, I've done enough of them now that you know it's sort of second nature to me. And I, when I talk to people and I say, you know, you should sketch that, um, you know, take, make a sketch. And, and I guarantee the next time you go back and look at it, you're probably, especially with brighter objects, you don't really bright objects are really hard to sketch, but you know, bright galaxies are pretty easy to sketch. Globular clusters are actually pretty easy to sketch. Um, in my opinion, most of them, uh, the people say, oh, I can't draw. And it's like, I'm no artist. I am no artist. Um, and furthermore, here's the really cool thing about it. You never have to show your drawing to anyone other than yourself. So if you're not, you know, but if it's just a tool to help you see, to, to force you to look through the eyepiece with a little bit more concentration, a little bit more focus, in my opinion, it's worth it. I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, that's a crucial thing to, to force yourself. You mentioned this during the talk as well, to pay attention. I mean, to actually look at it is one thing, but to reproduce it means you really have to look at the dimensions yeah. and the brightness. And it, it really, it yeah. is really challenging to do that. And I also think you're right that the main thing to do is just start doing it. I, I've never tried to sketch deep sky objects, but that was my experience with planets. I'll sketch planets. And I think the first ones aren't that great and you never think they're any good. But the more you do, you kind of develop a routine. Yeah. And, and you know, it does come along. And in the end, it's not too bad. And you actually do have a, a personal record of having done it. Yeah, I, yes, that is, and that's extremely true too. And my other love is Mars. And I've got, uh, going back to 84, I've got maybe about a hundred sketches of Mars, drawings of Mars. And um, I now really enjoy just going back and looking at it. Um, but they really force you to look at the planet. And that's why I, I particularly looking at Mars um, and, and Jupiter and the planets, if you're, if you're not spending 15 minutes looking through the eyepiece, you probably haven't really seen the planet. That's right. I mean, it's in my opinion, it's, it's so seeing dependent, especially at our latitude. I mean, you have to spend at least that much time yeah. just to get a few seconds of a good view. I mean, the Mars opposition in 2000 and uh, I want to say 2005. I was 2004, Ottawa. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I spent yeah. 12 hours looking at Mars, but I only had <laughs> about a fifth of a second where I really had a truly great yeah. view. You know, this is how it That's, works. Yes. And in and actuality, for me, with a 20-inch telescope um, looking at a faint galaxy. <coughs> I think we discovered it through intuition, but there's there's you know there's there's some pretty good science out there that shows that you know you you see the faintest detail you see that you can see the faintest magnitude you know of course not at low powers but at medium or even higher powers to and and that particular telescope has a 130 inch focal length so uh, observing with a 12 inch with a 12 millimeter eyepiece uh, you know with a half inch eyepiece is is 260 power. That was a fairly typical power for me, magnification for me to use with that telescope when I was trying, you know, when I'm trying to look at a 14th or 15th magnitude galaxy. And that's partly because it gets the image size so large that you're, you can actually start to, you know, you, there's, I don't, I don't necessarily understand it, but there's, there's some, uh, there's some pretty good science out there that shows how the eye interacts and how that helps you see the very faint, very faint uh, uh, details. Yeah, you need sufficient scale and, and, and that's for sure. You yeah. have to throw magnification at these things to make them large enough to start to see those kinds of things. So that's, and that's where in deep sky at that point, at least for me with a 20 inch telescope, seeing starts to matter just like it does with the planet. Huge. He, he, seeing is everything yeah. at those high magnifications because sometimes uh, there's nothing to see, but when you get a good night, there's, there's things to see that you would not otherwise have thought were there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's all very true. Hey, Bob. Uh, 
I'll just yeah. say I I'm uh, I agree completely with what you guys were just saying about you. I think you see much more when you when you try and record it and you try and draw it. There's you pay so much more attention to things. And I'm also a big fan of having a goal like that and and giving yourself a, a plan to go through everything. So, um, I think if I was down where you were, uh, I wouldn't necessarily stop and, and uh, use the telescope. I'd continue on to Dogfish Head Brewery in uh, Rehoboth Beach, but uh, good for you for stopping <laughs> well, there. Well, I, I go to Dewey Beach, but yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say is your biggest challenge when you were doing this? It obviously doesn't seem to be equipment. Would it be just time or what's the weather like when you're down in the, the DC area for seeing? Uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge by all by all means was the weather, um, and and I say that in particular because getting good clear nights in the spring, at new moon, is happens once maybe twice every three or four years. Um, so and now the fall objects they were gone you know early on I mean August. Other than the challenge in August is everything's hazy and 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 I don't even want to do any deep sky observing unless I can escape up to the you know to some altitude in West Virginia, and get out of the 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 the, the bowl of haze that forms on the east on the east side of the on the east side of the the uh, Alle the, the Appalachian Mountains, um, uh, but but uh, the really the real big challenge you know I had observed everything in the fall. Um, I'd even gotten out, you know, I had stayed up late and whatnot, usually in the, in the late fall to catch the, to catch the wintertime objects, but, you know, and, and to make matters worse for the ARP list, there's a lot of galaxies in the spring. So that, that was probably added another three, four, five years to the project. Good yeah, question. You're, you're, you're waiting, you know, you, you miss your opportunity. It's, you know, and the, the the hard part, especially as it's especially you know when when I, if I had done this when I was twenty or thirty, not a problem. I would have been out there at two a.m., you know, in January or February. <laughs> but by the time I'm in my forties or fifties, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, good for you. That's great. Thanks for the great talk. Yeah. So 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 Bob. Uh... Craig Levine's on the call and he answered my uh, request. He, he has a copy of the ARP uh, book to, to show. Maybe Craig, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe give some comments on the book. Yes, give me one second. Can you guys hear me okay? No, I can't hear you at all. Okay. <laughs> and you, let me just uh, flip this around here. Uh, let's see here. I saw away from my camera. I want to flip it around. Anyway, anyway, it's not a big thing. Uh, like I said, I have the. I got it when it first came out. I've always been fascinated with, you know, interesting objects and stuff. Everything's interesting, but I like the weird stuff. That's just just me. And and Erp, you know, you mentioned his uh, and David uh, David mentioned some of his, um, you know, history, where he was kind of vilified. Not vilified, but he was kind of sidelined and marginalized. But I found that you know just his fast it, you know his, his atlas would be incredibly fascinating you know, you, you're used to seeing pictures of galaxies that are symmetrical or you know um the spiral arms but you, you know when i saw this and i did a bit of reading online and then i, I picked the book up when it, when it came out just fascinated me just completely it's these were such interesting bizarre things i wanted to know more about them and it kind of you know took me a little bit away from my globular cluster fascination and i took a dive into these for quite a while so uh, we'll that's start, great. We'll start, we'll, start, we'll start the bidding at $100 for Craig's copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it is pristine. I'm a, I'm a book nut. So, yes, it is in very good, very good shape. Oh, you're just a nut. Yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I'm, really, I'm really sad that I didn't pick up a copy at the time it came out. It was a fairly pricey book when it came out. I, I now wonder how many they actually printed. But, uh, yeah. uh, and I was, I was, you know, my, my wife and I had two kids in private school and we were, she was a stay at home mom. So we were single income. So there wasn't much dollars going into something like that. <laughs> well, when I was younger, I had uh, more, uh, not as much common sense around uh, spending as I kind of do now, <laughs> you know, my wife will attest to that. 
Craig, have you been able to use the book in observing? I did a few years ago when it came out. I probably spent, um, I'd say a couple, what year to this, actually I got to see which year it was actually published. So that'll give me a more of a, an accurate timeline. Uh, Hopefully it says the year I'm, on it. Here it is. 2006. Going to get 2006 is about right. And that's just when I moved. I bought it just before I moved uh, to London, actually, because uh, that, that was 2006 we moved here. So the first three, four years when I was here, when it went down to Fingal, I'd try and observe as many of them as I could. I mean, most of them were you know, kind of tiny, faint fuzzies. But uh, it was a challenge. And, and to your point, too, the... Um, it really helped with my averted vision. Sometimes you know, we call it a averted imagination, but it really helped with, you know, I'd spend an hour, an hour and a half trying to build up the photons and the image in my mind. And that, was, <laughs> that was fun. And I was comparing it to the, uh, to the images in the book. Like how was I really seeing what I was seeing? You know, was, was that just my imagination or was the actual structures that I was seeing? Yeah. So does the book actually contain um sketches done by someone else other than bob or is it all well, photographs or computer no data? it doesn't have any of my it doesn't have any of my sketches but i believe it has sketches from either jeff or dennis and maybe ah. somebody else okay yeah i'm just gonna yeah there are sketches in here there absolutely are um and that's why jeff had come up sketch. to me at the talk yeah, Jeff had come up to me at the talk after my talk and said, I just wish I knew you had all these sketches before I finished, you know, before we finished the book. So did you have a chance to look at any of his work, Bob, and compare to your own sketch of the same uh, object? Uh, uh, we, you know, at that talk, he had a copy of the book and, and we looked at a couple, you know, and I had, well, see if I managed to unplug myself. This is... These are my originals. Yeah. And, you know, so we just, and I, and, uh, you know, we, we looked at a couple of them, but since I never, since I don't have a copy of the book, I, I, I never had a chance to sort of really compare. And you can see, you know, my basic, my be basic observing form has two, has two on each page, I can put two objects and I've got, you know, metadata information at the top, a little metadata information for each object and then, and, and well, to, to tilt this down a little bit. I don't know if you can see that or not. And then, you know, a place to take some notes, et cetera. Peter, did, you, did, did, did you upgrade Indra? Uh, no, but I did chat with her. Sorry, Rick. Oh, okay. Oh, Peter, I want to correct you. The, the bidding starts at uh, 500 Canadian. Oh, okay. Get it, <laughs> that's, that's 35 bucks US. So in other words, that, that, that's the second bid. My, my, my bid was for 100 Your bid is for 500 Okay, that's good. Yeah. About $35. I, I can take five, $35 US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, that would be good. <laughs> I just put another option in the chat. Alvin Huey, right, of Faint Fuzzies, has a guide to observing the ARC galaxies. <laughs> So it's quite nice if, if you look through the book and it's much less expensive than $500. And I just looked on Abe books and the Southern, Southern Atlas of ARP objects is on Abe books for a hundred and something dollars, I think, Canadian. Hmm. Well, of course the, uh, you know, getting sketches published is always a, you know, a, a big deal for someone who's done a lot of sketching, Bob, like you have. I don't remember if your any of your other sketches were published in any other books. No, I I've never uh, <coughs> I've never the the sketches have never been outside of you know outside of the you know the, a couple of talks I think I have a few of them on on my own website, um, but I've never tried to get them published or anything like that. Yeah, and we had a uh, Bob a, a few years ago I think it was just the year before the pandemic started we had a fellow down from Ottawa Center who was quite an accomplished sketcher. And he actually gave us a sketching workshop uh, on the Saturday morning after our meeting. And so we all got to sit there in a room, you know, in a classroom with sketching utensils and so on. And, you know, he, he ran us through some exercises. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm one of those guys who doesn't have any talent for sketching, but I, I really enjoyed the process of, of doing it. So it was kind of fun. And, you know, it was the kind of thing that, uh, you can sort of imagine 
developing into a series of workshops where folks would, you know, work, hone their skills and so on and so forth. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a bit more about the um, the, the the 31 inch in Ohio. How do you think the views compared through the 20 inch? I mean, you know, it's time and a half again in aperture, so it's going to be pretty much double the light gathering power. Did uh, did did you did did you see that in in casual observing or? Oh yeah, um, when I moved to Washington, um, the the my 20 inch didn't the mirror was was okay, and the telescope weighed. Um, when I moved it, the telescope weighed uh, on the order of 500 pounds. Yeah. And and uh, when I first moved to Washington, it basically took three people to set up. Yeah. Um, over time, I modified it so that I could set it up myself, and I got it. I put it on a diet and got it down to about 350 pounds. And even then, when I started to observe with it, I went through probably a two or three year period where I, it there. I don't want to call it an observer's depression, but it was sort of an, an observer's depression. You know, it was like I was so used to looking at um, the, the objects through the 31 inch. And in fact, I had written a series. I, we, we did a lot of public outreach with the 31 inch telescope. And uh, uh, I got very adept at taking people up four at a time. It's got a scissors lift to get up to the eyepiece if you've, if you, if you've never seen it. And I, you would take four or five people up at a time and uh, to the eyepiece and I would, you know, we would show them M13 or we would show them M57. And, you know, most of the time you can see the central star in M57 if you knew what you were looking for. But I, I would invariably have a little bit of spare time and, and literally between people shuffling around in a mighty lift, I, I, you know, I would look at M57 and I would scan around and M13 in particular, oh, there's a galaxy nearby, you know, slew, you know, move over a little bit. There's another galaxy. There's another galaxy. And uh, I realized that there's a whole bunch of faint galaxies around M13. And of course, this is like 1987. So there is no web. It, 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 there is no World Wide Web. You know, there, there is no digitized Palomar Sky Survey. Um, the, the, the closest thing I have to a resource that might show some of this stuff is the uraniometria. Uranometri uranometria uh, catalog uh, atlas, which was, you know, brand spanking new and top of the line. And uh, so I, I just started to make rough sketches as to where these objects were as I would find them. And then I realized uh, through through some friends at Ohio State, I, you know, the, the astronomy department at Ohio State had the sky survey plates. They had prints. And then they had these overlays that identified the objects. So I would talk my way into uh, into the the room, the locked room that had the the POS plates, the the Palomar Sky Survey plates, and I would use those to identify the objects and really understand what I was looking at. And then from there, I would write an article for the old Deep Sky magazine about objects near M13, and I did one objects near M57, and and so forth. And that was actually a fun; those were fun projects. Um, and, and they were particularly challenging because uh, <clears throat> Brian Skiff always held us up to very high standards of quality assurance. Holy cow. Um, now, the irony, the, the ironic story of that is to get access to the, uh, not ironic, but the, the, the real life changing story for that is to get access to the room, the locked room that had the plates, that had the sky survey plates, I had to find a grad student. And one of the grad students I found was this was this nice lady named Kathy and she's now my wife. So it was through that I met my wife. Which made it all the more interesting. Excellent news, excellent. And wish her well. I, I remember Kathy from our time in Washington in 94 as well. Yeah, she's, uh, well, she's teaching these days, having a lot of fun at it too, I think. Good, teaching good. at the college level. Yeah, I should, I should share with everyone the fact that uh, you know, it's through one of the things about Facebook, no matter how much we complain, is that it gave many of us an opportunity to connect with folks we haven't seen in a lot of years. And that's how Bob and I reconnected a few years back through Facebook. Uh, you know, it's just something you, it's so easy compared to going through a long process of finding email addresses or whatever. Right. So it's it's good. We were yeah. that way. 
Uh, Bob, I'm sharing if, a picture if, of the observatory. Yeah. Just just found this one on the web. It's not one of mine, but maybe you want to describe for us what the observatory compound there. Yeah, so this is a, a little, it's south, I believe it's southeast of Mansfield, Ohio, um, uh, in, in Ashland County, Ohio. The, when, I for, when we first started to go up there from Columbus, it was, it was about an hour drive, which back in the day was a long drive for us, and it's nothing for me today, it seems like. But um, uh, it just had a little clubhouse that's built into the, in, into the hill uh, in the very front. And with the observing uh, platform with the with the concrete deck above, that's above and behind it. And we would drive up and, and you could drive around at the time and unload your telescope and observe from the pad. Um, it is at a it is at a camp, um, a, a summer camp. And there, especially in the summertime, there was always challenges in interacting with the campers. Um, uh, the, the circle thing behind it is actually a camp, is, is a campfire thing. And, we would get up there on a nice new moon night and the campers would come up and of course they do what campers, you know, what kid campers do, they have a 15 foot high bonfire, <laughs> you know, and tell stories and stuff. And, but um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, uh, there, there was a local official, uh, there, there was a local gentleman who ran a business um, by the name of Warren Rupp, R-U-P-P. He, uh, he, he, his company built uh, uh, pumps, water pumps, different types of pumps. And he became a, a very, he became quite wealthy as a result of it. And uh, he, he, uh, he basically, you know, he, he provided the funds that ran the camp. Uh, a local astronomer, uh, a, a local amateur who was in this, in this particular club, he, um, he knew that a Cleveland amateur by the name of Norm Oberly in the 60s and 70s had made this 31 inch F7 mirror. That particular mirror, um, the piece of glass was a backup piece of glass for the math solar telescope that's on Kit P. And he had made this mirror, but had only set up a temporary telescope for a short period of time. And he knew the mirror was available and he talked to Norm and then he managed to meet up with the Rups and the Rups agreed to, to, fund, to fund the construction of the big dome that has the 31 inch. Um, it is a uh, uh, now 36 inch and it's on this huge cross axis English melt. Um, it's extremely stable. Uh, it took us a long time to get it working, not surprisingly. And it became quite the little workhorse for me, et cetera, especially, but I was willing to deal with it city with secrecies. And I think a lot of people found it intimidating. I think they still do. They find it intimidating to use because it's so large. Um, in more recent years, uh, the Rups have funded, uh, Warren has long passed away, but his uh, children run a, uh, uh, run, run a, um, what's a trust that keeps the camp running as well as uh, uh, helps out the observatory. And the observatory has, the club has formed a very, has, has developed a very uh, aggressive, uh, very robust outreach, educational outreach mission. And they built that beautiful building that's behind the dome um, for outreach and they, they host uh, a large number of, of classes, of day trips and stuff like that. And they have nice facilities for projection. And, and I suspect that wouldn't surprise me over the next month or so to find out that they're doing a lot of stuff with the new web images. Um, and they have a couple of, the, they have one of those blow up uh, uh, planetariums that they take around to schools that they also set up in the building for daytime use. Um, so it's, and it's, it's a nice active club right now. And they're still having a star party every, well, everything that got disrupted, but um, I've been back there a couple of times uh, for the star party. A bunch of us were going to try to have a re reunion there, but the pandemic got in the way. So yeah. that's a little bit of background for that. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And it does take me back to a few times that I visited the star party. Um, you know, the story for us Londoners is the most, the most dramatic occasion was we had a we had a president of our club named Dave Toth. Many of the folks on the call will remember Dave, and uh, Dave was a private pilot and had a share of a six-seater, uh, two-engine airplane. And so we flew across oh, nice. Lake, uh, across Lake Erie from London one Friday afternoon to attend the uh, the Hidden Hollow Star Party. That there were I, I think it was six or I think it was even seven of us because one of 
one of us uh, brought a child and sat him like sort of in between the seats. I think there were seven of us that flew across. That was quite an adventure. Anyway, yeah, I, what I'm remembering, the, the big building behind the observatory wasn't there when, when we went down those few times, but it would be fun to visit again. And you're making me think it might be worth a trip again. I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second here. I've kind of lost track of anybody. Did anyone else have any questions? Did I lose track of anything? And yes, my, my clock would made the uh, made the new mirror. Yeah, Dale keeps up on things. Yeah, and I understand it's quite good. I understand it's quite good. I just haven't had a chance to look through it. But... And it actually says how much the original telescope was overbuilt that they put a 36 inch mirror in it. So they didn't change this, the, the mount or even the tube or? That's pretty no, from what I, when I've looked, no, they haven't changed the tube. Um, uh, they, uh, you know, they were able, that's the biggest mirror that they could fit in and have the, you know, with the focal length. Right. Um, you know, that, 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 uh, that telescope is an interesting example too. I, and, you know, I, in, in 88, during the Mars opposition, I went up with a, a friend from Columbus multiple times as much as we could. And uh, it was sort of interesting. We discovered that uh, uh, if there was somebody else in the dome, the scene would get bad. The, the scene was better if there was only one person at the eyepiece. Hmm. And, and if, if my partner in crime would walk in and stand under the telescope, I could immediately tell when he walked in, when I was looking for the eyepiece. Wow. Yeah. Pretty darn good. Matt, uh, that opposition to Mars, we were down at Fingal. I, I don't know. I remember Dave McCarter was there. And we had my little C8 set up. And we just put it on Mars and left it there with a nine millimeter eyepiece and a three power Barlow. And seeing was so good. The whole had me for an hour and a half that Mars just looked like it was painted on the sky. And we're all commenting, seeing doesn't last this long ever at uh, at Fingal, but it was just that day. Bob, Fingal is our location of our club facility. It's not anything near as complicated as Warren Rupp Observatory, but it's our home. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all oh, these are, I'm looking at the pictures here that I had not seen these pictures. This is good. Doing the work on it. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, that's what you have, that's what you have to do. Uh, you know, you, you wait for those good nights. Um, I, uh, I, I, I do the, I do the relatively odd thing of during Mars opposition, I will take the 20 inch out to my backyard and leave it set up. Um, and then sometimes set up for like three months. And I use, I've over the year, years, I've used all kinds of different covers for it and just strap it down for the wind. And that way uh, I can, I can go out in the evening and uncover the telescope and start to let it cool down. And I learned through uh, just lots of experience that uh, there's relatively little reason for me to observe the planets before midnight. Um, and that, uh, you know, I, my, my best observing time is typically local time between 2 a.m. and about 4 a.m. is when the scene is the best. And I think that's a combination of both my location I'm, I'm somewhat east of uh, I'm east of Washington D.C. between Washington D.C. and Annapolis, um, and my my observing location and, uh, and and just getting having the telescope finally reach equilibrium close to something close to equilibrium. Um, I, I really the that my in general the observing here is much better than it was in Ohio. Uh, the, the scene is much better here than it is in Ohio, and I, I attribute that. I'm maybe ten miles away from the from the uh, uh, from the Chesapeake Bay, um, the temperature swings aren't quite as much as they are in Ohio from the, what I call the temperature delta between the high and lo the, the low. Um, my, my observations was, was at, at, uh, for, from, a seat, from observing and fine scene conditions, the less temperature change from day to night, the better the scene conditions will be. I think that's one of the reasons why the scene is so good uh, so, so fit, you know, so good at the, in the, in, in the, in, in the Florida Keys. I made that observation after realizing that, you know, my wife was still wearing shorts when we were observing at midnight that, you know, that all day long, you know, there wasn't that much of a temperature swing. So there's not as much, um, 
roiling in the atmosphere and there's not a, a lot of that, you know, there's, it, it just works better that way. And I think we're blessed here in this area to have a little bit, except maybe because we're a little closer to the ocean, maybe because of the downslope from the Appalachian Mountains that we've got that a little bit of an advantage there. You get more Every, see, everyone always can more laminar flow to, to an extent. Oh, yeah. and the best days, of course, are the hot, humid, hot, humid, muggy days of August. August and September. Um, a lot of people complain about how, you know, I, my, my, one of my favorite thing about amateur astronomers, they're always complaining about how bad their skies are wherever they live, with a few exceptions. And, and I'm like, oh, I, I'm doing okay here. I, I, the skies could be darker, but for planetary, it's, it's not bad.